All right, let's get into the three principles of portfolio risk management. These three principles will be the guiding principles for how we deal with risk when we set up a portfolio, or if you already have a portfolio. The, these are the principles that will tell you how to add to or change your portfolio so that you don't have to worry so much about different types of risk, mainly market risk and uh, cognitive biases. So why do we need to manage risk? Well, first of all, we all have biases. Some of these biases are personal. They are biases we've developed over our lifetimes. But some of these biases are actually cognitive biases that are across all humans or across all of a certain sex. For example, um, testosterone makes people trade more frequently. So there have been studies shown uh, showing that a man trades usually 45% uh, more often than a woman. So you can expect, let, let's say a woman is trading 30 times per year, you will see 45 trades per year for a man in his portfolio. Now, if a man generally is a better trader than a woman, then that's not a problem. But studies have shown that that's not true. So there's a bias of produced by testosterone um, of making a man trade more often is actually problematic because it's raising his commissions. So over time, we see women's portfolios outperforming men's portfolios. And um, well, you don't really hear a lot of women's success stories when you see books written by these guys who've made a lot of money. Well, that's simply because women don't really enter finance as often as men. But overall, that's that's the main the main problem. The main thing that is making men invest more poorly than women is a lack of control over testosterone. Um, so if you knew that, then you can appropriately deal with that. You can set a limit on how often you trade. Men also tend to trade more um, risky trades, for example. And we see mutual fund managers and portfolio managers, hedge fund managers that are males um, have bigger downturns or lose more money when the market crashes than women. So that, that's an example of a bias that you might want to manage. Now I just gave you one bias, there's many others that go across not just sex but um, across all people and then there's personal biases for example knowing an industry a little bit too well so that you're biased toward investing in that industry let's say you are a tech guy and you put a lot of your money in um, tech stocks well that's gonna be a problem if you have another internet bubble and crash like we had in the late 1990s so we want to avoid um, exposing ourselves to risk because of our biases whether they be cognitive biases or personal biases and one way we can do that is by the appropriate risk management strategies. Another thing we need to know and accept is that we can't accurately predict the market. No matter how good you think you are at predicting the market, you're probably going to be wrong you know, at least once uh, per seven years which is when the market tends to crash. Um, so don't bank on your own skill unless you have such a huge accuracy, well, if, if you were a person who had such great accuracy, you wouldn't really need risk management, would you? But most people are overconfident in their skills, and the truth is we really can't accurately predict the market. Finally, we are our worst enemies. It's easy to have trading rules and say that we're going to follow these trading rules, but it's harder to actually follow them. We don't have the willpower, usually. Willpower is a muscle and you use it up during the day and at the end of the day if you're like me and you're trading at night if it, it's the end of the day you might make a bad trade well if your portfolio is managed with that in mind um, you don't have to worry so much if you are controlling the risk of your portfolio then you don't have to worry a lot and what I mean by controlling the risk or managing the risk is essentially maximizing how much you can lose. So if you have a hundred thousand dollars in your portfolio, um, the traditional way would just be to put stop losses on your trades, but that can't protect your portfolio. There's still the possibility that your portfolio loses everything. Even if you put a stop loss so that you only lose half of your portfolio, there's still the possibility 
that you lose all of your portfolio. Stop losses are not um, the stop loss is not the solution to risk, and it's really not that useful. It often gets you out of a trade earlier than you would have liked to, and at a lower price than you would have liked to. So, for people who tell you that the stop loss is good enough and take profit is good enough for a portfolio, don't trust them. Um, when I first started trading, I, I felt, you know, I don't need to know a lot about risk management. All I need to know is take profit and stop losses. Where should I put them? And if I put them in the right places, then I'm protected and I'm always going to make money and take my profit before I lose my profits. I'm going to seal in those profits. Well, that strategy didn't, didn't really work out for me, um, which is why I'm now making this course, obviously. Um, if that was a good enough strategy, I wouldn't have moved on to different trading methods and actually found useful and profitable trading methods. The one I just spoke about didn't really get me anywhere. It pretty much kept my portfolio at 0% return for over a year or so. So eventually I looked into different methods and the methods I found to make more money were a bit more risky and then of course you have to look into risk management and here I am today presenting you with my findings and some of them I would say are novel, at least I haven't heard of a few of them before. So here we go. Here are the three principles. Now you're probably going to find the first one pretty obvious. Diversifying across investments. You don't want to be invested all in one industry or all in one stock. The second principle is hedging, which you've probably heard of. It means that um, if, let's say, the stock market um, goes down, if you're hedged, you shouldn't have a huge loss there because Traditionally, hedging means that you're long on some stocks and short on some stocks. So if you're hedged, some stocks will go up and others will go down. And that's the traditional idea of a hedge fund, but that's not how hedge funds work anymore. But I'm going to show you how to do that with stock options, which is really interesting because unlike stop losses, when you hedge with stock options, you actually can put a maximum risk on your portfolio. So you actually can be 100% sure that if your portfolio, if the market crashes tomorrow and everything goes to zero, if you use stock options to hedge, you can have that max risk. So if you are only willing to lose half of your portfolio, half of your $10,000 $10, portfolio, say, um, you can ensure that if the market crashes tomorrow, your portfolio will be worth $5,000. Finally, there's diversifying across time, which is something nobody really talks about when they talk about diversifying. People talk about diversifying across industries, but they don't really talk about diversifying across time, which is kind of a kind of neglectful because even if you look at the stock market, look at this guy's computer, for example, that's not a that's not a one-dimensional thing. That's two-dimensional, right? So um, there is time involved, and there are ways to diversify across time. Now let's move on to the first principle, diversifying across investments. You've probably heard of this before. It's the traditional way of lowering your risk, which is usually measured by beta. Beta is not really the best way to measure risk, in my opinion, um, but it's probably the easiest way we have. So um, what beta is, is a measurement of how your portfolio moves with the stock market. If beta is 1, your your portfolio pretty much moves in perfect accord with the stock market. And if your beta is negative 1, whenever the stock market moves up, your portfolio moves down. That's how it works. A lot of hedge fund managers and portfolio managers want their beta to be close to 0 so that the movements in the overall stock market don't affect their portfolios. And um, this is what we're going to look at. Now, um, funds are probably the easiest way to get yourself that that lowered beta. You want to avoid mutual funds and choose ETFs instead. And this table below actually shows you pretty easily and pretty visually why why you want to do this. Um, I don't know why mutual funds are so popular. Probably because of marketing. But the idea of a mutual fund is simply you give money to someone who pumps himself up as a really good manager and you pay that person one to two percent of everything you you just gave him um, per year 
and he manages your portfolio for you. Um, but you don't get to see what he's managing. You don't get to see what he invested in. Um, you don't really get to short a mutual fund. So if you think this guy's a bad, bad mutual fund manager, you can't bet against him. And finally, you don't get intraday pricing. So that mutual fund doesn't go up and down during the day. If the market crashes today, you won't know what your fund's going to be worth until tomorrow. So overall, mutual funds really don't give you any benefit um, unless there's somehow a great mutual fund manager who's making lots and lots of money. But in that case, he's probably going to be working for a hedge fund and not a mutual fund. Then there's ETFs. These are called these are it's called ETFs, but it stands for exchange traded funds. These are funds that trade just like stocks on the stock market, and essentially they're the same thing as a mutual fund. Um, but sometimes there's no real management. Sometimes it's just like a collection of uh, stocks that mimic an index. But what you're doing here is you're diversifying just like you would with mutual funds. You're diversifying by pooling your money with a bunch of other investors and having all that money go into a bunch of different stocks. Okay, But you don't have to pay management fees. Of course, the ETF has to make some money, so they'll charge you like 0.01%. Um, but that's not really going to affect you. It's just a drop in the bucket. Then there's the fact that they are transparent. So if you want to research an ETF and see where the money is in that ETF, you will see what that ETF is holding in terms of stocks. Also, you can short an ETF. If you think this ETF sucks and you want to make money um, by shorting it, well, you can do that. So if the ETF drops in price, you make money. And finally, you can day trade ETFs. You can see how the ETF um, changes throughout the day, which is pretty useful because it gives you access to candlesticks and things like that that will help you if you're a technical trader. All right. Then there's swing trading. Now, a lot of people don't connect swing trading with diversification, but it really is diversification. Because the idea is, if you look at the estimates of how many stocks you'd need to have a really uh, brisk managed quote unquote portfolio, you'd need over 200 stocks to get your beta down to zero and to be quote unquote diversified across industries. Now you can't possibly do that unless you're rich. So another option is invest in those 200 stocks over time instead of simply investing all of your money into them now. And to do that, you just have to analyze those 200 stocks and choose which one you want to invest in now because of whatever price action or fundamentals of the company. By swing trading, you get in at a low, then you get out at a high, and you just repeat the process with another stock later. Um, so it allows you diversification, and it also allows you improved profits if you're doing technical trading or even fundamental trading. You might want to buy a stock before an earnings report and then sell it after the earnings report. But your price for doing this is you don't get the tax benefits of holding a stock for the long term. So instead of paying capital gains taxes, you're actually paying income taxes. And if that matters to you, then swing trading might um, not be a great way of diversifying for you. That's something you've got to take into consideration. So if your personal income tax is really high, well, obviously you you will probably stay away from swing trading unless you're really good at it. So that's diversification. Principle two is hedging. Hedging is preparing for undesirable price movements. So if you're in the market, like the index of the S&P 500, for example, and you know there's a possibility of the market crashing, but you're not sure when it's going to happen, you might want to hedge. And that's just preparing for the worst, really. But Hedging is not stop losses. It's not saying when the market hits a certain number, we want to get out. That's not what hedging is. That's not how it works. Hedging allows you to stay in the market. And I'm going to show you how to use option strategies later in this course to hedge against bad movements in the market. So this protects you against crashes, and it allows for a true max risk. If you're using a option to give you a max risk, what that means is you know exactly how much you're going to lose on that stock if the stock goes to zero. Now, most people would say, well, of course, if the stock goes to zero, I'll lose 100%. But with stock options, 
You can make it so that you don't lose 100%. Maybe you only lose 80%. It depends on how much you're willing to pay for that insurance. So essentially a stock option for hedging is paying for insurance so you don't lose all your money. It also can protect you against sideways trends. You ever have a stock where you're just holding on to it and it's not moving and it's not a dividend stock so you're not really making money over time? Well, a option strategy that allows you to make money during a sideways trend is available to you. Uh, most people just don't realize it. Most people are afraid of the complexity of stock options, but as you'll see later in this course, they aren't really complex. You can make money pretty easily even when you are holding on to a stock that's not going anywhere. All right, so the final principle is diversifying across time instead of across investments. And people always forget about this one. The stock market has a time dimension. Obviously, if you invested right before 2008, if you put all your money in the stock market right before 2008, that's not diversifying against time. You would have lost a lot of money. All right, so how do you diversify against time? Well, I'm going to show you two ways. One is um, getting in and one is getting out. So um, look, the biases for stocks, they hold for time as well. Um, so I just gave you an example. If you're investing at the wrong time, you might have been investing right before the market crashed in 2008. Or if you're selling at the right time, you would have been selling at the bottom um, at 2008. So to avoid those things, you don't want to be biased and think, oh, the market's crashing, I gotta sell. Or the market's at an all-time high, it's gonna go higher, I better buy. You're really not sure what's gonna happen next, and unless you have some sort of insider information. But generally, even, even some of the biggest bankers in 2008 didn't know that the market was gonna crash. So to avoid that bias of thinking, we're at a high, we're at a low, and what should we do now? You're going to diversify across time. You're going to make your investments across time. You're not going to put all your money into the market today. Instead, what you're going to do is, well, for stocks, you're going to use these two. I don't know why they're out of order. I don't know why that man's dancing. Oh my god, what is this? Okay, well anyway, ignore this weird format of the slide. Here's the idea. Um, you're going to use dollar cost averaging to get into stocks and stage sales to get out of stocks. So they're basically the same thing. If you really like a certain ETF or a certain stock, instead of putting all your money in that stock now, you can use something called dollar cost averaging, which over time will give you more shares for your money. So let's say you're investing $10,000 and if you bought um, you know, Apple now, you would only get, let's say, 1,000 shares of that, or you get 100 shares of that stock. Well, if you use dollar cost averaging and you invest that money over the next couple months instead of all at once, you'll probably end up with more than 100 shares of Apple. And the way that works is simply math. I'll show you that in a later lecture. Selling is the same thing. Stage sales allows you to lower your exposure um, to risk in a stock that you feel is risky over time. So you're not doing it all at once where you might be at a bottom. Instead, you're just slowly selling over time. And um, for example, during the market crash, it's probably it, will, it, it wasn't a good idea to sell during the market crash. But if you were doing stage sales anyway before the market crash, you probably would have gotten out at a better point than most people did, which was at a bottom for a lot of people. As the market dropped and it dropped more quickly, more people decided to get out, and most people ended up selling at a at a near the bottom, closer to the bottom. Um, but if you're doing stage sales, it doesn't matter. You're always lowering your exposure to that stock until you're completely out of that stock. And you can do that over the course of uh, a period to just lower your exposure. You know, So instead of getting out all at once and reducing your exposure to zero at the expense of um, possibly selling at the bottom, here's the idea. We'll get into this in a later lecture, but the main idea is that if you want to lower your exposure to a certain stock, you're probably doing it for a good reason. You probably have reason to believe that this stock is going to have problems soon, or it's probably already dropping. And instead of just selling it like a normal investor would do all at once, you slowly lower your exposure until you 
are either out or you realize that this is a stock worth, thing, worth holding on to and you were premature to dismiss it and you still have at least a piece of that stock while it goes back up. So that's it. I'm going to go into the details of all of these methods in a each one having a lecture of their own later in this course. So move on forward and I would say just go through linearly um, but if you have something that I've just shown you in this lecture of particular interest you can of course jump to it. My only suggestion is that um, for the hedging strategies you'll see three option strategies. Do the first two before you do the third one.